Senator Greg Brophy was texting me as he was listening to the hearing in the Senate Finance Committee about Senate Bill 188, the family leave bill that is just a complete freaking nightmare. Uh, so I thought it would be just, I don't know whether, whether fun is the right word to describe it, but eye-opening to have a conversation with another good friend of mine, State Senator Paul Lundeen, who has either the fortune or misfortune to be on that committee and having sat in that room, having having sat through that meeting. Just one quick thing, Paul. I saw a piece in the New York Times just a few minutes ago. Scientists announced that they had at last seen or found an abyss so deep and dense that not even light can escape it. And I thought they were talking about the minds of the Democrats on your committee. It turns out <laughs> they were talking about a black hole the uh, first time they ever got a picture of one. But anyway, what was it like being in that meeting? Tell us about the mood, and then we'll talk about some of the substance, too. Absolutely, Ross. It's great to be with you. You're right. There is a deep, dark hole, and I do understand that they've, they've taken a picture of what a black hole looks like. I've seen it. I don't need to see the picture. I, I know what it looks like. And, and let me frame it up this way. Um, this legislative session, in my mind, and quite frankly, anybody who's watching it closely, I think, would say that's a correct assessment, has seen this accelerating redistribution of power over your ability to live your life as you see fit and hand it over to the inescapable authority of government. Um, we've seen it with the national popular vote, which says, you know what, some portion of your vote's going to California, some portion, portion of your vote's going to New York. It's not yours anymore. With the red flag law, we have seen um, a constitutional right, your right to be innocent until proven guilty. We're going to ship that off somewhere else and give it to the coercive power of government. And now, as you correctly identified, this Family Leave Act, is yet one more effort to say to every employee in the state of Colorado, whether you want it or not, whether you have a great relationship and a better plan or a better opportunity with your employer or not, you must do this. And it says the same thing to the job creating mom and pop shops, single entrepreneurs, small companies and large companies of Colorado. You know what? We're the government. We have a better way to do it. And here's how you must do it. You know, encouraging people to miss work for almost three months is not what anybody does who wants to create or maintain a thriving economy in the state of Colorado. What, what is your guess as to the impact on, on jobs and on company formation here in the state of Colorado if this passes? Absolutely, and it is a guess. I will tell you, we sat down to the dais for the hearing on this, the second hearing um, on this, because it had been laid over for action. It was such a confused mess in its first hearing in the Finance Committee. It got laid over for a couple of weeks, and they reworked it, came back with a strike below. As we sat down to the dais, we were handed a six-page fiscal note that said, oh, by the way, this billion dollar or more than billion dollar fee or tax, depending on how you look at it, and I think it's probably more correctly represented to be a tax, this billion dollar fee or tax that's being put on all the employees of Colorado, here's an analysis of the financial consequence. Um, read it, if you will, during the course of this, this hearing. I mean, we are moving so fast. The Democrats are jamming so much through so quickly, we can hardly even look at the analysis. At the same time, we were handed a report, a study that's chasing to catch up with the, the conversation from um, the REMI partnership, and it speaks directly to the issue you're raising. It, it, and it has done, uh, NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, has done an analysis, and they're racing to keep up with this conversation about the family bill as well. And this analysis predicts that over the next 10 years, the consequence of this bill will be the loss of 14,000 jobs in Colorado and a decrease in the disposable income of Colorado of $1.8 billion. Well, that goes to your question, Ross. What about forming capital, creating a company, standing up a new idea, delivering a new set of services to the people of Colorado? It takes capital to do that. And if we're sopping it all up in a redistribution program that the government is going to collect and then redistribute through this process, that capital won't be available to create new enterprises and to create new jobs. Negative impact, in my opinion. 
One thing that Brophy told me, and I wanted to check with you to see if this is correct, is that the Democrats are now looking to pass the bill but defer it's actually coming into force where they wouldn't start collecting taxes until what 2023 brophy said is that right and benefit not until 2024 is that correct there are different ways of looking at it um they, they're and it's a moving target um the, the kickback the pushback um in committee has been very strong there are of course a few advocates who are supporting come in and say what uh, california has done what new jersey has done what rhode island has done we want that what washington state has done we want that and you kind of get the theme of what types of states are choosing to do this massive government growth program um but the the, the uh, various uh, individuals that have come in have largely been job creating uh, companies, job associations of job creating companies. And they said, not so fast, bucko, we need to slow this down. And so this conversation of how quickly does it get rolled out, I think is a live conversation. The way it's constructed right now, there would be a study. We need to walk through some actuarial studies to truly make sure what the assumptions are would work out. And then it would roll out over time. Um, so the time frame on this may be a bit of a moving target, as public policy sometimes is. Um, but as drafted right now, it would not delay until 23. It would move prior to that. Okay. The single most important data point in the discussion or assumption is what percentage of Colorado workers would take advantage of this benefit? I know this is right, something that you right. talked a lot about yesterday, and we only have a couple minutes left here. Can you explain what the numbers Boy, look Rod, like? You and, told me I had an hour. You and, said I had an hour. You need to come in studio if you want to be with me for an hour, but I'd be happy to have you. So what what is the Democrats' assumption, and what do you think the right number is, and what's the significance of the difference? All right, so the Democrat assumption, and it's not the Democrat assumption, it's the fiscal analyst assumption, um, is 3.5% adoption rate. Okay, good, good wag. It's a place to start. What did Rhode Island experience? 13.7. Okay, so they had an adoption rate more than four, almost four times the assumed adoption rate. So we're looking at this program that had a 3.5% assumed adoption rate is a billion-dollar program. If the adoption rate's twice that, it would push towards $2 billion. The, the reality is we don't know, um, and we know it's going to be an enormous um, effort and undertaking under the smallest assumptions. Here's the, where the challenge is. This is being set up to be an enterprise so that it, it cannot receive more than 10% of its funds from the general fund. The answer that I got in the committee yesterday when I asked if we are headed towards insolvency, how would we, in fact, how would this enterprise that's being stood up, how would it be managed to stay insolvency? And the answer was, well, we would, we would take on more debt. Now, just you're a financial guy. You get the understanding that when you're in financial trouble, the last thing you want to do is take on more debt. And that was the answer to if we're headed for insolvency because our, our assumptions were too low, what do we do? And the answer is take on more debt. You know what? I don't want to do that on behalf of the people of Colorado. No, and the people of Colorado voted for Tabor, and just and I, and I don't even mean that. that okay, uh, two things. Tabor should apply here. This is a tax, and people should be allowed to vote on it. Yes. But my big, by my bigger point is, I think most Coloradans recognize that we have avoided turning into a fiscal basket case like California or Connecticut or Illinois because of Tabor. And now they want to go around it, every, not just in this, every time they can. Look, I've got less than a minute here. Is it true that the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee basically told you to shut up yesterday? <laughs> you know, anybody can tell me to shut up, and it's not going to happen. When I'm elected to represent the people of Colorado, I'm going to stand up on my hind feet and represent the people of Colorado. It was not that direct. The mm -hmm. reality is... When we're pushing hard on policy, sometimes tensions get a little bit high, but it's my goal to be the most charming pain in the neck that I need to be when I'm representing the people of Colorado. And, and yes, that was the tone for a few moments during the hearing yesterday. You are the most charming pain in the neck that I know. Uh, State Senator <laughs> Paul Lundeen, actually, just for my listeners who don't know you well, uh, what number is your Senate district and where does, what does it cover geographically? 
Well, I tell you what, I'm elected by the people of Senate District 9, which is the northwest corner of El Paso County, the northwest corner of Colorado Springs, and includes the Black Forest and Monument where I live. But I represent the people of Colorado. I work for everybody when I'm down here at the Gold Dome. State Senator Paul Lundin, graduate of the leadership program of the Rockies. Thanks so much for being here. Um, fight the power. Ross Newton, thanks. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Coming up next, uh, some parents, including celebrities, are pleading guilty in the college entrance exam scam. We've got some ideas on whether they'll go to prison, but if they thought the guilty plea would be the end of the problems, yesterday we learned differently. It's the new Dan Kaplan.